Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. This is a call to order of the City of Aspen City Council regular meeting for April 16th, 2024. Could we have a roll call for attendance, please? Councillor Doyle. Here. Councillor Guth. Here. Councillor Howenstein. Here. Councillor Rose. Here. Mayor Tory. Here as well. Uh, welcome, everybody. It doesn't have to be so quiet in here. <laughs> right on. Um, we have, uh, we're starting off with uh, some scheduled public appearances for sure this evening. Um, and we're gonna start this off with Chief Ferber first and then uh, I'll come up in just a little bit. But Chief, I was thinking maybe right at the end of that table if you would there, and maybe turn the microphone that's behind you just towards you a little bit and that should be enough. You can stand or sit, whatever you like. Thank you, Mary Tory. If I may, I'd just like everybody at the table to introduce themselves. I'm Kim Ferber, Chief of Police. Michael Bullioni, Pickin County Sheriff. Gabe Muthing, Chief of Aspen Ambulance. Brad Flanagan, Emergency Operations Manager for the Pickin County Regional Emergency Dispatch Center. I'm Jake Anderson. I'm the Operations Chief for the Aspen Fire Department. Well, we are here uh, this afternoon to thank all of you for recognizing the joint life-saving efforts and heroic, heroic actions of our first responders. In the early morning hours of February 29th, an emergency call was placed to the 911 Communications Center when a young woman's life was in immediate danger. As a direct result of the quick response and decisive actions of the dispatchers, the first responding police officers, fire and EMS personnel, CPR was performed and an AED deployed with careful precision. The patient, her husband, and small children aren't in attendance this evening, but they have shared and are happy to say that the wife and mother is expected to make a full recovery. Um, thank you. Before I call up our first responders, um, for our appreciation. I'd like to read an excerpt of a letter that was written from the spouse of the patient. You changed our lives on Thursday, February 29th, between 1 and 2 a.m. Within minutes of my 911 call, you were in our house administering CPR to my wife on our bedroom floor and ensuring our kids did not wit witness a horrifying scene. Some of you knew one or both of us, and I vividly remember looking in your eyes and understanding that the only outcome you would accept was success. The level of diligence, teamwork, and willpower you projected imbued me with confidence that no other group of people could have. CPR ran so long that I feared I would have to inspire you to continue at some point, but you showed not one moment's hesitation, only commitment. It was written all over your faces in the quick decision-making and decisive action. Without all of you, I have no doubt we would have lost her. I think about you every day. I thank my lucky stars I live in a place with such a sense of community, and I hope to convey in small measure my gratitude to each of you. Um, chokes me up a little bit. Uh, I, like a lot of you, know these people. They're a, a community family and um, just amazing. Uh, what it says to me really is that it could be any one of us and we should all be thankful that we have these guys uh, behind us every day. Um, it's, it's often interesting uh, trying to give appreciation. Most of the people that provide these services don't really even want the recognition. But it's so important for us as a community to recognize them and also to make everybody aware that they are there and they are here for you. So um, I'm going to call up uh, the individual members that responded to this call and acted. Um, maybe council members, if you might jump at that end. Uh, Chief and the rest of that table, you could stay at that table, but stand and face the audience, perhaps. All right, grassroots, I'm giving you a run for your money today. <laughs> You know, we have a certificate of appreciation here, and obviously this can't convey our full appreciation. So 
for what all these guys did. So I'm going to call up from the Aspen Ambulance District, Tom Wills. Will you come on up? From Pitkin County Emergency Dispatch Center, Tony Rutledge. <laughs> From the Aspen Fire Department, Sarah Fioretti. just to the guys that responded on this call is to those guys that are out there guys and girls sorry are out there every single day um, you know for for a lot of you that have lived in other communities you may recognize how special this is here in Aspen for those of you that haven't trust me um, the responders that we have uh, and the uh, from dispatch on over to the guys that are that are right there given CPR at the end everybody in between uh, is just amazing here in Aspen we should be so thankful. One more round of applause for all of you. All right, that'll bring us to citizens comments and petitions. This is an opportunity for folks to address city council on items that are not scheduled for a public hearing. We do ask that you limit your comments to three minutes to give everybody a fair and equal opportunity to speak. Are there members of the public that wish to speak this evening? Dan, we'll start with you right up front. Hi. Uh, come on up to the table, please. Either seat in the middle is fine. Okay. Mics are on, and if you just introduce yourself for the record, that'd be great. Okay. 
Hi, my name is Dan Glick. I've been a resident here for 35 years, and after witnessing that, I had no idea that was taking place today, so my request seems rather trivial compared to that. But um, I'm turning 60 this summer, early June, and I'm trying to have a birthday party in one of the parks, and I'm a member of the Eagles Club, and the Eagles Club said, no problem, I could use the club there as long as everybody's invited, which there's probably over 300 members at the Eagles Club these days. But, um, uh, you know, no problem. Kip that owns Conundrum Catering is going to cater the thing with, uh, you know, burgers and hot dogs and things like that. But I was just trying to use the park that's below the Eagles Club, uh, which is called Newberry Park, to have people there, um, tables where they can eat rather than in the parking lot. Um, it's going to be on a Sunday, June 9th, from 3 to 8. I was also going to have a band play. And, um, you know, I knew I had to get permits. And in the permit process, I've been denied uh, just a hard no from everybody that I've talked to. So that's when I come in here to ask you guys what I can do to try to use that park. It's just during the day. Um, you know, the river will be flowing full blast by that time. Um, Everything's greened up. It's very pretty down there. I don't think there's a sprinkler system there. Um, so, like, setting up, I would just set up a small stage, like a platform type thing for the band, and then tables and chairs and maybe a couple tents uh, just in case to keep people out of the sun. Dan, could you share why they told you they denied you? I, I don't know other than I talked to, first person I talked to was um, Austin Weiss, who I ran a marathon with him. 20 years ago for Challenge Aspen, and I know that he's somewhat in charge of a lot of that stuff, and then he deferred me to Sam Lovestat, called him, and then he said uh, that he would check with the parks. Bless and he you. got back to me about five days later and said that the parks turned me down, and too many people um, can't have a band, that type of stuff. So, have, have, so you have not filed a formal... Um, permit request, park reservation request, or permit request? Uh, everything's been verbal. And then I came in here yesterday, and then they said, well, you can go in front of city council tomorrow and just say what you wanted to say. So that's where I'm at. So why don't we just get the application in process, find out where the fatal flaws with parks is. You know, we obviously have parks rental policies, so I'm sure that this is just coinciding in some way against those. We'll find out. If council members are interested. Yeah, I, I think that's the right way to go. And I'd okay. request, Scott, that you um, ask Parks to provide explicit reasons of how his oh. application does not comply, if it does not comply, um, and, and allow him an opportunity to modify the application to, to, to meet the regulations. I, I think yesterday. An email <clears throat> about the conditions this application um, we require four hours or less use no amplified music and less than 100 people and I believe you're over all those uh, right. requirements right okay so so once again uh, it falls outside the parameters of what parks could uh, could do it, uh, it is possible to an appeal something like that to this body, but um, why don't we get it in front of us? Uh, lucky for all of us, we have another regularly scheduled meeting one week from today, so um, we can handle this pretty quickly. Scott, can we get that information? And yes. Thanks. I think what I time did, should I've, we be there, Dan? I did. I forgot. <laughs> I did fill out a form yesterday when I was here visiting, um, trying to find out what to do. So I remember filling out a form there. So I don't know if that's the application or... or uh, well, maybe follow up tomorrow with... Um, it's too late today, I think, but follow up tomorrow, make sure that you've successfully applied for the... Okay. What I don't know what that form was, but I encourage you to make sure that it's successfully filed and keep us posted. Okay. And then what should I do after that? I'll walk you through it. I'll get with you. Okay. All right. Yeah. So... <laughs> call you in a little while. Oh, what's that? Sure, I'll call you in okay. a little bit. Do you have my number? Or? I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Dan. Dan. Okay. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks. Other members of the public that wish in the back, come on up. This is a follow-up from a couple about a month ago. 
State your name for the record. Yeah, my name is David Lettingham. I'm the executive director of the Aspen Fringe Festival, <clears throat> celebrating our 16th year. I'm very grateful for the support we've received from the uh, Wheeler Arts Grant Program. Just want to say that. Um, I made some ca comments here, some very unmemorable comments because I was uneducated. So I got educated and I just wanted to pass on some stuff. I had a, um, a meeting with uh, <coughs> John Barker and team and discussed some things about the new, the new um, kind of amendments to the uh, grant program in the fall. Um, <coughs> Uh, we received a 54% cut in the grant funding this year. Um, even though a large increase in grant funding was recently improved, our artistic mission, excellence, impact has remained the same. Um, I decided to do some research, spoke with Tom Ward, who was on the original committee in 1978, presented some com comments to John Barker and staff, which he plans to share with you all at some point. I really hope my comments just help you refine this program and make any more, you know, any changes to it that you deem should be made and make it more transparent and equitable. Here's the main points I spoke about. The original tax was raised by the sale of properties in the city of Aspen to support the Wheeler Opera House and provide support for visual and performing arts. That was amended in 21 to provide support for the red brick and the phrase cultural, visual and performing arts was amended. However, after looking at several of the ballot measures, there is no wording regarding the location of the cultural, visual, and performing arts to be supported. It seems the voters should have known the scope of where these funds might be used before voting to approve. It's my understanding support is being provided to organizations in Garfield Eagle and even Grand Junction. When I voted in favor of the measure, I assumed it meant local arts, you know, Roaring Fork Valley, whatever. But my question to you is, should arts organizations that serve Aspen have priority given that the <coughs> tax revenues are paid by city of Aspen residents? After my discussion with the grant program team, it's my understanding that under the new rules implemented, there's no consideration given to the length of operation of nonprofits. Um, my question to you is, should there be consideration given on the context of ongoing historical impact? Um, three, third point, uh, for arts organizations, artistic excellence is the main reason for um, awarding funding to, uh, and this is on the grant website, artistic excellence. Um, <clears throat> there's no requirement, however, there's no requirement that any of the volunteer review committee members actually see any performances, view any videos, uh, do anything like that. I, I realize that this is a near impossible thing to do, um, it's kind, but it's kind of like voting on the Oscar award for best picture without seeing the movie. Um, <laughs> recently, uh, the in-person session with the review committee was terminated, so now their only way of gauging artistic excellence is by reviewing the grant application, <coughs> which is really a metrics. Yeah, Three we're, minutes. We're close? Okay, I'm almost there. No problem. Um, uh, there was a new 15% cap added on the grants to limit organizations from applying for more than 15% of their operating budget. Small organizations often operate incredibly lean budget that is extremely efficient and utilizes tremendous amounts of volunteer time. Um, I'm just hoping you'll see that this may not be equitable, especially if that was implemented to make sure that these organizations are feasible and will continue to go the long haul. It should be considered that by being a member like I have been operating for 16 years, that should be proof that we are a viable organization. So my recommendation is to apply consideration on the length of operations to the 15% cap in some way and taking into account that it's inherent for this program to first provide consideration to the arts organizations that serve and provide performances and services to the actual citizens and visitors of Aspen. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thanks. Thanks. Any can questions? You, can you leave that letter with the clerk? Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, Nicole, if you get a chance, can you share that with Council or and John Barker as well? Thanks. Uh, other members of the public for comment this evening? Come on up. Hello, good evening. My name is Alfred Menendez, and I have prepared just a brief uh, statement about a issue that I find in our community, community that I believe deserves your attention. Um, like I said, my name is Alfred Menendez, uh, and I moved to the Roaring Fork Valley in June of 2023. Became a resident here of Pitkin County. I live down in Holland Hills, but I work here in Aspen uh, proper. Since I've moved here, um, I have not been able to enjoy uh, any indoor establishment without being insulted by nicotine flavoring agents like diacetyl, which is a chemical linked to lung disease, heavy metals, and other dangerous and toxic chemicals given off by people using electronic smoking devices, more commonly known as vapes, <coughs> inside buildings in direct violation of several laws. This has impacted me at my place of employment, as well as while I'm trying to simply be a patron of several different businesses. One thing I have noticed at all of these businesses and that they all have in common is none of them have any kind of no smoking signage posted either outside or inside any of the establishments. I've reached out to both individual business establishments as well as the Pitkin County Public Health Department and the City of Aspen Environmental Health and Sustainability Department to understand how and why these very serious violations of the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act Pitkin County Code, Title 6.40, Pitkin County Clean Indoor Air Act, and the City of Aspen Municipal Code, Chapter 13.16, City of Aspen Clean Indoor Air Act. How these violations are continuing to be allowed to happen while endangering the health, safety, and well-being of the public, whom you, as public servants, have the responsibility to protect. After many emails back and forth reporting violations of applicable statutes and asking why the signage requirements and the aforementioned laws are not being enforced, I was told that, quote, they, meaning the City of Aspen Environmental Health and Sustainability Department, have been advised to follow the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act requirements since that is the most recent legislation and supersedes the older city quote, code, end quote. This was told by the City of Aspen's legal team. I believe that this explanation that the municipal and county laws requiring signage do not apply simply because the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act is the most recent legislation and therefore it replaces all other requirements, although the CCIAA specifically states it does not and will not invalidate any stricter local laws. Find that, I believe that is uh, simply wrong and is a misinterpretation uh, by the legal team to understand how the Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act was meant to interact with local laws. I'm just here today to ask you as public servants uh, here in Aspen, tasked with protecting the public health, safety, and well-being of the citizens, residents, and visitors to the city of Aspen, to look into this matter and determine what needs to be done to ensure that all, um, all establishments, businesses, etc., within your jurisdiction are following the applicable laws that were duly passed. Please take my plea to heart and uh, make this issue an utmost importance just I, I ask you to look into it. Like I said, it affects me at place of employment as well as when I'm trying to dine out or just enjoy myself. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Do you have any suggestions on how, how it could be better enforced? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I don't, I don't understand and know all of the channels through by which enforcement is done. Um, however, from my readings and understandings, um, both the City of Aspen Municipal Code does have requirements for non-smoking signage, either to be posted outside on uh, exterior entrances or inside um, within certain uh, jurisdictions, as well as Pitkin County as well, which I understand is not necessarily uh, at issue here. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how the enforcement needs to happen. From my understanding, to the best of my knowledge, it appears that we have rules and regulations on the books um, that were duly passed uh, to create this uh, signage, but they're not being enforced. Um, so I'm just asking you to look into it and possibly determine how the enforcement, if it needs to be done with the existing laws, or if new laws or new code needs to be updated 
to uh, bring enforcement into place. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Other members of the public for public comment this evening? Rachel? Welcome, and uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Rachel Richards. I have been a resident of Aspen uh, for just about 40 years. Um, I went to the work session last night, and a number of questions were asked, and, and I thought I might be able to add a little clarity. One was, why not get rid of the rod, or why not just you know find a way to get rid of it? Um, I don't know if you'll be able to do that or not, but there are other signatories to the rod who would have to choose to get rid of it as well. Pickin County, Snowmass Village, uh, I think CDOT and probably the feds. So it's not really just an Aspen decision. So I had to ask myself, why would we want to get rid of a rod? Why would we want to not have a new EIS to test the council designed entrance? And it's because it may not stack up. It may not uh, be able to handle the traffic projections our community is going to face 63 years from now because we want this bridge to last and to work as long as the last bridge worked. Um, for a great many of us, the exercise um, did seem to be more about saying, how can we fix the entrance to Aspen without using the Merle property? The goal was not how do we fix the entrance to control traffic growth or how do we fix the entrance to best support our community goals. It was how do we avoid the use of the Merle property. And we got that answer, you know, we could spend $22 million on trying to ease the path to a three lane bridge and then we could self fund um, and, and walk away from the federal money for a $80 million three lane bridge but none of the other costs were included in those estimates. The infrastructure for the overhead lighting to designate the lane changes every 100 yards or so coming in and out of town. We're not really looking at the trees that will be lost or the historic structure at the end of town. It was just kind of glossed over. It will just cut the sidewalk off a little bit. I think, I think you'll end up taking the whole building by the time you really analyze the turning radiuses. Um, you know, we looked at three years worth of bidding for improvements at the Brush Creek intercept lot. And every year they came in just about double the amount of money we had. So I think you can count double the estimates or pretty close to double of what you were told because there's most of the infrastructure is not there. It's not how, how does it connect with the roundabout? How does it connect with the rest of the town? What does the signalization look like? There's, there's millions of dollars of unaccounted for cost in that. <coughs> um, you know, uh, uh, EIS is not a, a bureaucratic measure. It is something that is tested. And I understand that some people don't like the old rod. Well, please stop using the new Maroon Creek Bridge, which was approved with that. Or stop using the bus lanes, which are bringing in our workforce daily, which were approved with the old rod. Or the roundabout. We could go back to the six lane CDOT had originally designed with a signalized intersection that stops traffic left and right. The reason an EIS is going to be used is to look at the efficiency of the mass transit system, as well as other purposes. But you guys don't want to see what two dedicated bus lanes, one in each direction, stacks up to a third reversible lane that will leave one lane of traffic at peak times always backed up, and those buses are simply mixed in that traffic. So, um, you know, I'm a taxpayer. I pay federal fuel tax. I don't want my federal fuel tax being used in Minnesota while our communities are taxed again to pay for the entrance. We all pay federal fuel tax to build federal roads, and that's where the majority of CDOT's monies come from. So if we're asking them for money that's not federal, I don't know how that happens. I also pay sales tax on my cell phone bill for the BRT, for the bus rapid transit system. And I didn't hear the users of those systems mentioned at all last night. And what I severely think would be a good idea is for every member of this board to spend a night in Battlement Mesa at a hotel 
and then get up at five o'clock in the morning to get ready to go to work, to drive to a park and ride, to get on a bus, to come up to Aspen, to work for maybe a dollar or more an hour than they're paying in El Jebel right now. And you ask yourselves, how well is this entrance going to tell our workforce, we appreciate you? And we know that when you have two hours to drive back home, that time matters to you. And you don't want to be just a bus priority, you know, behind all the luxury vehicles, which are no longer asking their guests to ride the buses. I think we're dealing with traffic problems of the past rather than looking at the future. Where is our workforce really going to come from in the future? I'm co-working with people now who are coming from Battlement Mesa and Rifle on a daily basis. And I'll tell you, they're gonna jump off sooner than Aspen if we don't treat them with the respect they deserve because Mid Valley is the new economic center of this, of this valley. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to participating in the EIS. I look forward to the scoping. I look forward to making sure whatever council comes up with is compared to the outcomes of the existing record of decision. And I can guarantee you, you will need a record of decision. You were told that a year ago. They don't just magically change because Aspen has preferences. And you want the best example? It's when you go down to the front range and there's all the mountains looking over the front range, look out hill. They didn't want any cell towers up there. They didn't want to ruin the view plane. That was a sacred mountain. But the needs of the entire community for safety and for access and for internet and signals, those towers went up. And that's what's gonna happen in this town. And I think it'd be better to design a program that really works for us. But no one's gonna spend 200 plus million dollars on a system that won't work in the year 2055. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Other members of the public for public comment this evening? Looking online as well. Good evening. <laughs> Probably. Good evening. Um, Tara Nelson, I live on 707 Cemetery Lane. I've been before you before to talk about traffic calming measures, and I just wanted to circle back and let you know that I did see there's a 10 mile per hour speed limit sign on the um, biker path. So I hope that as we embark upon uh, the spring season that we can communicate that effectively, but I just wanna send my gratitude to those at the table and those um, with the city staff that are helping to um, calm the environment on Cemetery Lane. I don't know if they've posted a new speed limit sign for the cars, but I do see some speed limit signs for perhaps the e-bikes that go along that path. Um, so as my children are trying to cross the road or catch the bus, I just wanna um, give some gratitude to those that helped to get that calming measure in there. So hopefully we have a safe spring summer. Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Do you know, um, when we did the speed limits to 15 in all of town, I think we lowered cemetery to 20? We lowered cemetery lane to 20 and it's posted. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. <clears throat> Other members of the public, for public comment this evening? Looking online as well? Seeing none, I'll bring it up to council tables. Council members, this is an opportunity for council member comments. Anybody have comments this evening? Bill, I'll start at the end. Thanks. Um, firstly, just wanted to share how that life-saving proclamation made me feel. I'm just so grateful to live in this community and have people that are this dedicated to, to taking care of us and keeping us safe and saving lives. Um, so echoing all the wonderful things that Tori said and, and Kim said, and I'm just deeply appreciative. Um, secondly, the, the, the Armory RFP process for design sort of brought to a head some um, concerns that I've been having about our, our RFP, um, our contract award process and our, the, the way that the winners of um, contracts are presented to us as, as the final decision-making body. Um, 
for certain types of contracts over certain thresholds. And I, I've been thinking about how we can have a little bit more information in as part of that final review and decision making process. Um, specifically, you know, how, how did the selected winner of that bid stack up against other bidders? Um, specifically, what were the criteria that made that bid stick out? Uh, I, I feel like all we are, the reality is all that we're, we are presented with right now is what has been selected by staff with no justification, no understanding of what the other options are. And um, while that may be not such a big deal when we're talking about purchasing a vehicle, for example, to me it's a really big deal when we're talking about uh, a project that's of great importance to me, like, like the armory. Um, so I, I'd like to make the request, and we don't necessarily need to decide this tonight um, if, if you don't feel ready to answer this question, but I'd like to ask each of you to see if you'd be supportive of having staff um, give us some more information on how we could improve the transparency of the, of the bid approval process at the council table. Um, so I think uh, you're, you're making a request. We could start with a meeting about it, right? We need to we get all the information too, yeah. to everybody, see if there's changes that we see viable and all that. So is there other council member support for um, getting some information about RFP process uh, and whether that's the reporting out of committee process or uh, other, is this a conversation that two other members of council would like to have? Yeah, I, I think it would be really useful to have a work session where we discuss the whole F RFP process throughout the organization and make it a public meeting um, um, available to everybody and then its transparency will be uh, presented at that time. And if we see that there are areas to be improved upon, we can uh, go from that point. Okay. Yes, and I, I would add that uh, one thing I'd love to see improved in the RFP process is seeing the RFP before it's officially issued um, so that I can see that it has the correct constraints because the issue that I take with it is not that staff doesn't do a good job, which I believe they do. It's that I feel like I and we up here are rubber stamping something that we're not as involved with as I yep. wish we were. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, Scott, we're, we're going to you know, want to know a little bit about the RFP process as it sits now. Um, and it sounds like, um, you know, specific inquiries are about uh, seeing the RFP before it is issued um, and uh, more of the results uh, and insight into the process. Those are just two, two starter topics on that. Thank you all. Um, it, and yeah, I wanted to echo sort of something Sam just mentioned is, is this isn't uh, an attack on staff who I also believe does a good job. I, I, I just personally have a hard time approving something when I don't know what the alternatives are. Um, and so a little more information would be great. And, and along those same lines, uh, many of you know that, that I've been very frustrated with the service level provided by community development. Uh, Department of Aspen lately, and I, I wanted to clarify, that is not personal in any way, shape, or form. Um, it, I think that the, we are fortunate to have a really wonderful community development staff and, and led by a really wonderful leader in Ben, and, and what I am taking issue with is the overall service levels, not the individual people or personalities in any way. Uh, I'm not saying that, that uh, the, the um, direct interactions with individuals are the problem, the system is the problem, and the processes are the problem, and the timelines and the turnaround times are the problem. Uh, the administration of our rules is the problem. And so I just wanted to clarify and make sure that uh, if, if, and I'm sure there are people who have taken offense by my, by my um, raising the issues about the level of service, and I want to assure everyone, I, I actually quite like many of the people that I've interacted with in the Community Development Department over many years um, and appreciate them, and I'm trying to improve the system and, and the service level as a whole provided to this community. That's it for me tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. John? Yeah. 
Okay, so the latest from NOAA is uh, Earth just had its warmest February on record. Last month continued the world's record warm streak with February 2024 ranking as the planet's warmest February on record, the ninth month in a row of record warm months. What's more, February 2024 wrapped up both hemispheres warmest December through February period on record, according to scientists from NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information. Some good news out of California. They just set a benchmark for renewable energy with wind, solar, and hydro, providing 100% of the state's energy demand for 25 out of the last 32 days and counting. That's uh, pretty significant, especially since California is one of the biggest energy users in our whole, whole nation. And lastly, I got this from Aspen Public Radio today. Our local energy provider, Holy Cross, is on target to hit 90% renewable power by 2025. That's next year. And 100% by 2030. Right now, they are delivering 76% uh, of renewable energy was delivered to Holy Cross users last month. So some really significant progress in renewable energy. Um, I'm glad our community is part of it. Thanks. Thanks, John. Ward? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, this evening is a good demonstration of um, the degree of cooperation that this town um, has with all of the first responders, um, not only in the city, but all of these things are just under the surface that we take for granted, and if we are unaware of them, um, think that they're not there until an emergency situation arises. Um, I've witnessed uh, command centers for incident command centers for uh, X Games and understand the degree of us uh, uh, cooperation within the, the city, the county, the state, and even the federal government uh, that uh, I don't think people here are aware of. And because you're unaware of it doesn't mean it doesn't exist and it's not there when you dial 911 because it is. And the dedicated people that filled this room um, help make this community something that is a, a, a really kind of a dream to live in instead of a nightmare. So my, uh, my appreciation goes off to all of those uh, agencies that cooperate and that um, practice at being uh, in communication and are ready at the, um, at the time of need. So that, those are my comments tonight and thank you to everyone. Thanks, Ward. Sam. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to echo all that and say what a wonderful community we live in. Um, that was an amazing celebration, and I think uh, we all might know the family that was involved. Um, so just what a close, tight-knit community we live in. Um, the jersey I'm wearing is from the University of Denver. They just won their 10th hockey championship, which is the most of any school in D1 history. Very proud of that, very proud alum. And then on city council business, um, in our information only packet, we had um, follow up for like ballot questions. And I just wanted to ask um, when it came to the next steps, uh, when we might see those come back to us. Uh, it, it's always fine to do these information packets, have questions asked and then not know when or how to answer them necessarily. Next week's meeting. Oh, okay, wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, my comments this evening are very brief. I um, spent a week in Queenstown, New Zealand. Um, it was part of our sister cities exchange. Um, it was an amazing trip. Uh, Queenstown is a, a community that is uh, more sizable than ours, a lot larger, but the similarities are amazing. What they are, uh, dealing with are a lot of things that we are dealing with. In a lot of ways, they are ahead of us. In a lot of ways, they're learning from us. Um, I did uh, bring back a hockey jersey. And because this is a double XL, I'm just going to go ahead and slip it right over everything. And I don't know if anybody has a camera available, but if somebody could just take a quick photo to share with the mayor of Queenstown, I'd appreciate it. This is the uh, seven-time champion Sky City team, and this is the 
This is the, thank you so much, Ben. This is the captain's jersey. Go soccer. And the reason this is important me to send a photo back to the mayor is because <clears throat> Mayor Glenn Lure is over in Queenstown. Uh, he set up a meeting with me the night before our, our, our three days. We had three days of intensive meetings. Sunday night, he wants to get together to just know each other a little bit before we have three days of meetings. Uh, I had brought him a couple items from Aspen, and, um, but I didn't bring them in a bag or a box or anything. So I went to the front desk of the hotel and I asked if they had a bag that I could use to give, give the mayor these gifts. All they had was a laundry bag that said laundry across it really big. So uh, that's what had to do, that's what had to do. I took the bag to him and as I sat down, I just said, thank you so much for meeting me this evening and this is really handy because I have a little bit of laundry that I could use back. <laughs> um, and his face just dropped. He thought I was completely serious. I guess I gave a good delivery to it. But as we were leaving, he decided that he wanted to give me a little bit of dirty laundry as well. This is a game-worn jersey from the captain of the team. So thank you for, Ben, I'll get that photo from you to send it over to the mayor. With that, that comes to any agenda amendments tonight. I don't see any. City manager's comments tonight, Scott? Uh, the only comment I have is uh, the discussion about RFP process. <clears throat> we'll come back with a full description of the current process and then legal issues, and then we'll let you uh, have a meeting to comment on what you would like to change. Sounds good. Uh, from the suggestions that were at the table, and there may be deeper and more as we get into it, but from the suggestions at the table, uh, Sounds very doable for uh, more eyes on a little bit more information at different stages, and that can be very doable. Thank you. Uh, board reports. This is an opportunity for any <coughs> brief board reports. Of course, we do a full update uh, once a month, but any board reports tonight? I have uh, at least one. I'm, I'm trying to remember when the last time we did board reports was. It's been about three weeks. Um, I'm just going to go with uh, Board of Health. Thank you. Which was earlier this week. Um, there was some concern because the detox facility uh, out at uh, Picking County Health is in, in danger of possibly going away. Um, there is a, a sister location in Summit County. Um, they will be coming to us possibly for more funding in the future. but. Um, and there is a Glenwood facility opening soon with nine beds. Now of, boy, there are a lot of statistics we went over at this meeting. Um, basically detoxes peak during June. No coincidence, that's when Food and Wine Festival is. Um, alcohol is by far the number one substance abused across the board, all drugs, all substances, and uh, other substances are usually used in, com in combination with alcohol. Uh, Admissions, most admissions are from Aspen, um, and most admissions are through Aspen Valley Hospital by themselves, through the family, and through Aspen Police Department in descending order. Clients that are engaged in treatment, 80%, that's really high, and, and we should be commended for that. Uh, moving on, avian flu has been ID'd in over 40 mammal species, which is very concerning because we are mammals. Uh, there have been some mass seal die-offs in other mammals, and uh, World Health Organization has their eyes on it. Measles cases have been going up despite being, being declared eradicated in the early 2000s, so we are going back to measles vaccinations. Um, and if you were born before one night, its vaccinations are ordinar ordinarily uh, understood to be lifetime protection against measles, but if to be on the safe side, if you're born before 1990, you may request a second va vaccination. Gun violence, we went over that as well. Um, suicide is 75% of firearm deaths in Colorado. Uh, suicides are the, the leading cause of firearm deaths in the nation. 85% of firearm deaths are men. Firearms have overtaken motor, motor vehicle crashes as the leading cause of deaths for children ages 1 through 18. That's sobering. Uh, that's, that's more than cancer or suffocation or poisoning, all former leading causes of death for children. 
Um, let's see, we've got House Bill 1292, banning assault weapons is uh, on the agenda at State Assembly this, this spring. And we're looking for more gun carry restrictions across the state. And then locally, we are looking for a place for safe gun storage because uh, we are in what's called the donut hole of safe gun storage. Um, I volunteered that our board would be likely to support any funding requests for trigger locks, which is a very simple way of keeping guns safe. Um, the recent case in Wisconsin, the school shooter whose parents went to prison because of his actions could have been prevented by a trigger lock. That's all I have. Thanks. And thanks for covering the Board of Health. Board? Yeah. Um, Mike? Yeah, sure. After um, on the tail end of a 2,500 mile road trip, uh, <laughs> I got a phone call from Rafta that uh, uh, both Sam and Tori were out of town and without, without somebody from Aspen being there, uh, there wouldn't be a quorum. So I went to the Rafta board meeting last Thursday, which was great to see the people again, um, all the staff. and. Bill Kane, uh, mayor of Basalt, is rotating off the board, and David Knight, the new mayor-elect, uh, is going to be on the raft board. Um, it's such a um, an honor to, to to go to the raft meetings. They're really probably the best organized and run meetings of any of the boards that I've attended over the years. I did about six years with raft before rotating off this last year. Um, some of the things that were covered in that meeting were the, by 2050, um, the goal is to be 100% uh, uh, renewable and off uh, fossil fuels. And currently it's 8% uh, 8, 8 of the RAFTA rolling stock is on electric and 92 is fossil fuels of um, compressed natural gas or diesel. And that going forward, uh, the mix is going to be moving towards hydrogen, uh, but uh, certainly battery electric buses in the interim. And when uh, hydrogen becomes, um, goes to the tipping point where it's more available, those, those buses in the future will probably be hydrogen. And because of the um, um, constraints of the Aspen uh, maintenance facility, only electric uh, buses will be serviced in uh, in the Aspen end of the valley and the Glenwood Springs maintenance facility will be the, the um, refueling for the hydrogen and electric as well. And so as, uh, as we move forward, uh, those percentages are gonna be moving higher and higher towards renewables. Uh, and again, looking for hydrogen in the next um, 25 years of being uh, the, the major form of uh, propulsion for the public buses. Um, it was also pointed out that uh, the trail system the, is, uh, is part of RAFT uh, and it's, it's not just a bus system, it's also um, a transit corridor for uh, bicycles, pedestrians, and e-bikes. Uh, and uh, the, I think there's gonna be a I think they're calling it, instead of a retreat, a summit uh, in June 13th of this year. So um, again, it was uh, an honor to go back to Rafton, and uh, represent the city of Aspen there, and what a great organization. Thank you for covering that, but I'm still gonna make a note of June 13th and assume that you're not gonna be at that one. Thanks, Ward. That'll bring us down to consent calendar. Consent calendar this evening is resolution number 49, funding request for headquarters community mental health fund. Resolution number 50, procurement of seven 2024 fleet replacement vehicles. Resolutions 51 and 52, Hallam and Garmish storm pipe and water main replacement project and the draft minutes of March 26th. Are there any items that need to be pulled for further discussion? If not, I could take a motion for the consent calendar. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. second. Third. Motion is second by Sam. Any further discussion? 
Can we roll call vote for the consent calendar, please? Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Guth? Yes. Councillor Howenstein? Yes. Councillor Rose? Yes. Mayor Tory? Yes. Uh, thank you all for your support on the uh, Community Health Fund. Uh, you know, interesting that John brought up the fact that the detox facility uh, might be closing down. Uh, there is some new news arriving as well that um, there are some other uh, mental health facilities in our immediate area that are going to be um, uh, looking at opportunities for reductions as well. I'll say that as diplomatically as possible. And so this couldn't come at a more important time. Uh, I really hope that um, perhaps uh, the Aspen Times or the Aspen Daily News would assign a reporter to follow up on this. Uh, as council is uh, looking to support mental health wellness in our community. And I think that is extremely commendable and extremely timely. So thank you again. Well, that'll bring us down to action items. Uh, do we need an, a continuance on this item? Yes. Thank you. So we had some demolition permit appeals. There are further discussions that are going on with these. So uh, some of them may still come to us, but there is a need for a continuance to, uh, looks like, I have a date that it would May not 14th? look like. Two uh, not two weeks. Uh, May 14th is the request. Is that not a regular meeting? I have got April 9th, or, or, or at least the notation makes me think, but that may be when the memo was from. Yes. Okay, so thanks. If you look at the request of council, city attorney's office is asking that this that the six appeals hearings that were currently set following these are all demolition allotment appeals following the lottery that occurred in February, that those be continued to May 14th. May 14th, um, thank you. Of 2024. I believe that's a regular meeting. Um, for the reasons stated in the discussion, I'm happy to answer more questions about that, but uh, it does take a motion and, and just a, a verbal vote. Great. I, I don't think we need a resolution. Thank you. All right. Motion for continuance. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Yep. Bill? Yeah, I'm supportive of the continuance, but uh, I just want to mention that this is yet more evidence that um, a lot of staff, community, our time is being wasted on this program. Um, I, I encourage staff and, and this council to resolve these lawsuits. Um, I encourage us to consider eliminating this program or significantly reforming this program to find something that does produce results for our community because I am certain we're going to end up resolving it one way or another and uh, this is not producing any results for our community. It's causing a lot of angst, wasting a lot of time, and uh, proving to all of us that it is not successful. Thanks. I would say that's your opinion. It sure is. That's why I said it. Thank you. Um, could we have a roll call vote for the continuance, please? Councillor Doyle? Yes. Councillor Guth? Yes. Councillor Howenstein? Yes. Councillor Rose? Yes. Mayor Tory? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I believe the next item on the agenda, Mayor, is a request for an executive session. The city of staff is recommending that council go into executive session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statute Section 246402 Sub 4A, which is the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real personal or other property interest, and Section 4B, conferences with an attorney for the local public body for the purposes of receiving legal advice on specific questions, and Section 4E which is determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations, and instructing negotiators. This, the specific items of discussion involve the following. <coughs> ongoing litigation concerning um, the Centennial Owners Association versus the City of Aspen. Um, if council wants to go, vote to go into executive session, all executive session will be recorded and the recording will be maintained by the clerk for a period of not less than 90 days. As usual, if council chooses to go into executive session, the executive session will be convened downstairs in an electric pass conference room, and the meeting will be adjourned without returning to this room. And how long will those records be held if we were to go into executive session? Not less than 90 days. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Okay. So. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? I'd just like to yep. make one quick comment to let the community know that that we 
all five of us and staff are spending a lot of time in an effort to try to um, come to a resolution on on this issue. Uh, it's not easy. We have to we have to weigh the um, interests of the community of Aspen and the Centennial owners collectively. Um, we are we are trying. We are hopeful we can come to some kind of resolution. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, all right, with that, like we said, we will not be coming back up here to adjourn. We will adjourn from the Electric Pass. We want to say thank you, as always, to Grassroots. We appreciate you. Oh, thank you. And then I'll take it. Yeah. I think we have to do a roll call on that. Did we? Yes. Oh, we have a roll call vote for executive session. Councillor Doyle. Yes. Councillor Goose. Yes. Councillor Howenstein. Yes. Councillor Rose. Yes. Mayor Tory. Yes. <laughs>